for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Rob. Uh, that's my stuff. Uh, basically, the only thing that's important up there is I write comics, so those are pretty sweet. Uh, but I also do some of the cyber -y things out there. I have the uh, CTI course they authored. And so how many of you are in my CTI course this week, by the way? Yeah, looking around. Gonna, yeah, all right, perfect. So I got the CTI course, and then I've got the instant response course for ICS. It's kind of like a hunting instant response course for ICS that I do. Uh, a little bit about my background. So I started off uh, as an Air Force guy and went over to the intelligence community. And when I got there, they said, here's your team. Now we want you to do stuff. And I started off and said, cool, what's my requirements? Like, what am I supposed to do? And the feedback I got was, find the unknown unknowns. I'm like, what does that actually mean? And they're like, you'll figure it out, which uh, is a horrible tasking. But what I ended up saying is, you know what? I like control systems. Control systems are sweet. I'll focus on control systems. And I generated my hypothesis that new nation state teams that the intelligence community wasn't tracking could probably be found targeting control systems. I figured if you're a cool nation state doing cool offensive stuff, at some point you're going to overlap with industrial control system environments like power grid, water infrastructure, oil gas. I bet we could find some sweet stuff there. And that ended up leading us to finding new quote unquote APT threats that the intelligence community had never been tracking before. Uh, nation states that we didn't even think were to the brink of doing these type of operations were operating in these environments. Um, and that, in essence, was a mix of a hunting and an intel focus. And so I'll talk from my perspective in this presentation basically about that kind of material. So let's talk about the three takeaways. And you'll notice I put a lot of little Bobby comics in my slides. Uh, I usually like explaining things to large audiences and small, condensed, three-pane comics. I feel it can, uh, goes well. Down there at the bottom, we're just talking about the CTI Jedi Council, which uh, sounds like a joke, but we, uh, we arrogant few uh, actually created that group. And so Rebecca and Sergio and, and all the folks that are here this week uh, we have this group, and that's where this talk spawned. Um, Alex Pinto and I uh, got in a little bit of a heated exchange about automation when it comes to threat hunting. And my position was very, very straightforward. You can't do it. Uh, you should leverage automation. Every smart hunter leverages automation. But automating the entirety of the hunting maturity model is not going to happen. And you can't, and we see a lot of filth and hype and, and sort of rhetoric in the community about don't worry, my AI magic solution will take care of everything on the network. I'm like, eh, we've got human threats. We need human defenders. We want a defensible environment with all that stuff, but it's, it's human v. human. Um, of course, if there is anybody in the community who would figure it out, it would be Alex. Um, him and his company are doing some amazing things. But uh, that's the nexus of this talk. That's what I'll talk about today. So I won't bore you with the 20-minute version, because obviously you all know what this is. I just thought it'd be sweet to look at a historical view. I skipped Alex's presentation so that I won't uh, biasedly talk to things that he did or didn't, so I don't know if he covered any of this. But when we talk about threat hunting, a lot of people miss out where it actually started. And I thought just one slide on the history of it would be fun. Um, early 2000s is when we started seeing that threat hunting term pop up. Richard Baitlick wrote a, a great blog post there at reference at the bottom that goes over this. Um, and actually, one of the first articles in the community on it was 2011 in Information Security Magazine, not Cyber Warrior Extreme or Cyber 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 stuff, but Information Security. It's almost as good as like Sysadmin Weekly. So anyways, Information Security uh, Magazine, he wrote this article saying, we're doing hunting in the GE cert based off of what we were doing in the AF cert, the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team. That's actually where a lot of it came from. It kind of Dual came out of the NSA and AFCERT around the same time. Can't figure out which one actually came up with the term first. But back in the early 2000s, people focusing on that dedicated hunting approach. Thought that was cool. A little bit of hat tips where that term came from. But to lead into this discussion, I'll note that everything about hunting from the beginning, before any marketing and buzz terms, every bit of it was focused on humans looking into their networks past automation. So whatever IDSs and AV and everything was catching, that's all the automation stuff, looking past wherever the automation was getting to them and going on hunting trips to look for things that weren't getting caught. It was the whole nexus of the term. So why can't it fully be automated? This is my comic for Alex. Uh, so I've got little Bobby here, and Matt runs up to him and says, little Bobby, what are you doing? He's like, hunting threats. 
oh, well, threat hunting does require the human focus, but more with forensics and security automation than bows and arrows. And little Bobby looks very upset and says, well, I can still fully automate this, right? And he goes, nah, maybe removing the human would be wrong. So uh, I, again, I'm a big fan of keeping that human in the loop. And I would note, for those of you that come up with the mindset that human focus is the one percenters, right? Only the 1% can do hunting. I, I would disagree. I, I think there's definitely some of those people that are just rock stars and doing cool stuff. David Bianco's uh, obviously been referenced probably in every presentation here this week. But I very, very much believe that any of the community that goes forward and just does something a little bit more than their day-to-day -day job and says, you know what, I'm gonna open up Wireshark or Snort. I don't care what it is, it doesn't have to be your fancy tool, but anything where they say, I'm gonna go a little bit further, you know, that's the 1% of the community, the people that go past eight to five just to say, I'm gonna do something a little bit more. I mean, my entire career has been inspired by people like that. The reason I'm here today is because of those people that wanted to go just a little bit more, and I thought they were awesome, and I thought we were doing cool things, and it inspired me. So uh, it doesn't have to lead to the discovery of the APT. It can just be a focus of trying to be a little bit better. So that's what I want to talk about. For anybody that's seen anything I've ever presented before, you probably see me throw this at you. Um, the sliding scale of cybersecurity. The whole focus here, and, and I won't bore you to death with it, but the whole focus is there's different categories of things you can do for security. I wrote it specifically because I operate not only with technical folks uh, and leading my company and doing cool stuff in ICS environments and SANS courses and all that, but I also uh, work over at New America, which is a think tank uh, with policy folks, and I get to play with Congress critters all day. And like meeting all these congressional members and their staffers, their view of security versus our view of security is very interestingly different. And it always boggles me when I ask people, like, what do you do? And they're like, I do cybersecurity. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, that's not a thing. Like, what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? So I said, here's the five categories you can focus on. What's most relevant here is offense is a horrible return on investment, and getting it right from the start with architecture is a great return on investment. So you basically have this sliding approach that as we learn and do things, we should be driving as much as possible to that left-hand side of the scale. We should be trying to figure out how to make and build better systems to start with. So to me, when I talk about hunting, I'm talking about active defense, humans involved. You've got all your tools and your architecture and your sensors and sims and whatever else, that's all your passive defense. It's technology on the environment doing stuff without human interaction. But the active defense, the human focus is human v human. We want good architecture and passive defense, so it's a defensible environment. But what takes a defensible environment and makes it defended is only the human. So when I talk about threat hunting, I put it in that active defense category. By my own way of looking at the world, which is not necessarily yours, but my own way of looking at the world, if you automate it completely, you move it to a passive defense. That's the point. That's awesome. The more that Alex and people like him can focus on returning automation and driving it back to the left-hand side of the scale, the more we're gonna get out of that investment. That's awesome. But by its very core, the human process, that, that's the hunting focus. Obviously, you've seen this. I just kinda had to throw it in there. What I did wanna note, though, is down at the bottom, for those of you who are brand new to the community, <clears throat> and you're like, yeah, I've heard this term all week. Uh, David Bianco and I published a SANS paper, and it's down at the bottom, on the who, what, where, why, and when of, of threat hunting. What's all the stuff you need to know about it and understand sort of where to go? Uh, so that's, that's a good approach if you're interested. Also, here's my major defense to Alex. Uh, quoting Sergio is always bonus points for anybody in the community, by the way. Anybody that's been in the community long enough is usually doing something based off of what Sergio wrote at one point in his life, uh, which is almost depressing and exciting all at the same time. Uh, so I loved this when he said, look, it can't be fully automatic, otherwise we just call it an IDS. And that, to me, is the easiest way to sum it up. It's amazing if it's automatic, but hunting by its core is the extent of automation exhausted, and I'm going a little bit step further. So what does that mean to me? And this gets back to what I coined as the jawbreaker. I mainly did it as a joke at first, I have to be honest with you. Uh, David Bianco has this like pyramid of pain thing going on, and I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. How do I do something entirely stupid too? And I was like, jawbreaker. Jawbreaker would be really cheesy. That sounds awesome. Uh, and so I created it, and then people ended up liking it and using it. And I was like, oh crap, now I've actually got to you know, make it useful. So here it is. Uh, here's the useful version. Uh, and this is what I think Alex was referring to this morning with the whole biting the jawbreaker. 
These are the things, in my opinion, if you're talking about hunting, you need to have a sort of core tenants in your mind. Number one, threat hunting requires the focus to be on people. Obviously, that's my big opinion. That's the whole point of we're not going to automate it fully. But number two, your job focuses on human uh, adversaries, but you may not encounter adversaries. That is really hard for people to get their minds around. It sounds like a really trivial statement, but let me explore it a little bit. Uh, I'm usually a very ADD kind of tangent storyteller, so I'll, I'll break away from this for a second to tell a story that brings it to the point. Uh, I was in the US intelligence community, stationed in Germany in the era of the Snowden leaks. What a fun time to be alive. Uh, so in my working in this intelligence agency, you take your pick which one it is, in Germany, got all these people that have known me for years there, and I've always told them, hey, I'm US intelligence community, that way you don't have to associate with me if you don't want to, but if you do, I'm gonna hang out in these hacker spaces. And I go teach, and I have fun, and I would constantly go to uh, CCC, the Chaos Computer Congress. Wonderful, amazing people there. Uh, but after the Snowden leaks, we saw a bunch of influx of those people, right? the, uh, the you're spying on me all the time, and oh my gosh, my life is ruined, uh, tinfoil hat kind of wearing people. Anyways, so because they knew who I was, I would consistently get people coming up to me, and they're like, I know you're spying on me. I'm like, what? Like, I know you are spying on me. I'm like, dude, I have three easy questions that can solve this right now. Number one, do you run operations against industrial control system environments around the world? Like, what? Like, do you attack ICS infrastructure? Like, no, cool. Do you research nuclear weapons with the intent of blowing up people? <laughs> They're like, what? No, no, God, no. Like, cool. Number three, do you hang out with terrorists? Not like friends of friends of friends, but like tea time with terrorists. And they're like, no. I'm like, then I don't care about you, okay? Like, it's not, you're not important in my life. Going back to the adversary discussion, the downfall of all of this hunting stuff is you could spend a whole lot of money, do a lot of cool, fancy things, spin up the best team in the world, and be stupidly bored you might not get targeted. You might not be an important to an adversary. And that's hard for everybody to get a raft around their mind. Because everybody likes to think you're super important. Like, yeah, I'd totally get targeted. Like, that's a weird thing, by the way. But like, a lot of people have this view of, of course the APT is coming after me. Like, maybe not, dude. Like, understand your risk profile, what makes sense in investment in your organization to mitigate that risk, and go forward. For some people, it's a really experienced hunting team. For some people, patch your systems. You know, there's a balance. So number three. You need the open-mindedness of a new person, but hunting is not for new people. And although I said we want everybody to do cool stuff, and I do think that everybody can hunt, if you're gonna have somebody in a position to do hunting, like an actual dedicated focus, I think it is entirely wrong to put a new person in that position. I don't think it's beneficial to their development. Go focus on something first. Malware versus engineering, network analysis. Uh, go learn policy for all I care. Like, do something cool that you get hyped up about. Then bring that talent in and operate as if you are a new person. Open mindedness to ask questions. One of the best operators I ever had was this young Marine. And we had all these wonderful people on my team. We had 30 really, really sharp folks um, in the intelligence community. And this one young Marine would consistently just ask the stupid questions that nobody wanted to ask, and it would lead us to these beautiful discoveries. And I also liked him because when I told my Air Force guys, like, hey, I want you to find China, I was like, what would China do and think and whatever? I'm like, ah. They'd be like, Marine, find China. Control, kill, sir. And I'm like, yeah, we're good. All right, so uh, sometimes you need a little bit of focus, but asking questions is also good. The other thing I'll note is that product vendors will pitch you hunting, but it's not about the product. And I know this one sits a little bit weird at this event with all the vendor booths. So let me say this nicely. I am a dirty vendor. I have a technology product. It's not pitched to any of you guys because I focus on ICS, but I'm a dirty vendor too. And with that, I will say it's not about vendors. It's completely about people. Do we want cool, cool tools to do cool things? Absolutely. But if I was gonna spend $1 and what percentage of that dollar would be focused on people, all of it. I would figure out the technology later. No matter where I go, no matter how many companies I see, how many people I teach, the singular complaint I always get is human focused. Nobody comes to my class and goes, I really hate QRadar and I wanna use QRadar better. I'm like, uh, what do you actually wanna do? Like, oh, my management sucks? That's the one I always get. My manager sucks. Or I don't know what I'm doing and I want to do better. I prefer the latter 
because by the number of people I've heard tell me my manager sucks and it's the entire industry, like somebody's not being honest with themselves, right? Like not all the managers can suck. Some of you apparently are just maybe coming up a little short, but either way, you need to rely on automation, but you can't fully automate it. Again, the whole point of my talk, if you're not using automation in today's world, you're doing it wrong, period. And I guarantee you are, even if you don't realize it. And like David talked about in the hunting maturity model, move it across, just like Alex hit on. I really like the whole, let's try to move the model along to make sure that we're using automation effectively. It's like, rock on, everybody can get around that. But be careful with what you're teaching your systems. Be careful with what you're teaching your people. Am I teaching my new analysts as they come on the team that don't worry the box is gonna tell you when something is wrong and I want you to respond to it? Well, they're always gonna be tied to that box and they're never going to progress? Or do I wanna say, go figure out the science behind this and then use the cool tools? When I stand up teams, or I had to stand up the Dragos team, I was like, hey, cool, congratulations, guys, I'm gonna hire a bunch of fun people, you get no budget. I'm like, what? I'm like, nothing. I want you to use open source tools, I want you to use open source feeds, I want you to use everything that requires you to learn about the community. Then, when you can make the justification later on of what you actually wanna do, go do it, go buy the product. Because if you just go to a vendor, and I get this question all the time from customers, like, cool, uh, does your product do these things? Like, yes, awesome, good targeted question. Or is it the reverse? Uh, what does your product do? Uh, it makes you milkshakes and gets your presents on Christmas, man, it'll do whatever you want, sign the check. Like, if you ask a product vendor, no matter how good they are, like, are you amazing? They're gonna come back and be like, I'm so stupid amazing, it's ridiculous, you should buy my product come in with targeted questions based on doing it without fancy tools. Cool, so let's get into the ICS case studies, which I find to be more fun. First part of the talk is very much, you can't automate hunting fully. I'm happy to have any sort of debates with people, but I think just on the nexus of what that term is, you cannot do it. Um, but the case studies are what I find to be really fun. So I like industrial control system environments. It tends to be my passion. Um, I, I mentioned this at the uh, same thing at the CTI summit, but uh, I don't really care sometimes when students are like, I lost another 10,000 credit cards. I'm like, that's cool, man. Um, it sucks, you'll get over it. Like, I really care about power being there, oil and gas pumping, uh, water being available to the community. I get really jazzed up about ICS. And nothing is more exciting to me than one, educating people, I love that, or two, really screwing up an asshole's day. Like, that is so much fun. So I love hunting in ICS environments because we deal with the types of threats that are like national level programs of I need this capability to be able to turn off the power for wartime scenario and wherever else. Awesome, I love denying that capability. That just feels super exciting. And I love hunting that's trivial. The more basic your hunting hypothesis is and still works, the more excited I get. Like I will tell you before you even get to the case studies, my favorite thing in the world to look for going into an ICS environment is Bing. Bing.com, why? Because nobody uses Bing, all right? Like nobody. <laughs> so when I go into an industrial control system environment that's supposed to be disconnected from the internet, guess what? I shouldn't see Bing, I shouldn't see Microsoft Windows downloader update, you know, updates.com, any of that crap. But what happens is I see internet checking from malware before they connect up to command and control servers and go, oh, that one's infected. Or uh, an electric utility we were in recently, uh, there was a call out to an NTP server at Microsoft.com. That seems completely legit calling out for network time protocol to Microsoft.com. Problem one, probably wouldn't be reaching out to the internet. Problem two, the bigger problem, is because there were such time sensitive systems, don't rely on external NTP servers, rely on GPS. So anybody doing a network time protocol query from a sensitive environment like an electric utility, that's wrong. And it was malware on the system just trying to figure out how to connect up. So, cool stuff, let's talk about case studies. To get into case studies, and to understand a little bit of the difference between ICS. Um, I've done a paper on this, you can go research it. I'm gonna give you the two, two second little Bobby version. The kill chain, useful tool. Uh, Lockheed Marketing uh, has really uh, made it interesting for folks to use the kill chain with a straight face. Uh, but it's great about putting data into buckets and being able to analyze adversary patterns over time. That's the whole point, not predictive anything. It's just about being able to observe patterns across different schemas. It still works at an ICS, but it's only stage one. So in an ICS attack, the types of attacks we're worried about most, power going out, water stopping, et cetera, that's just stage one. What ultimately happens is the adversaries have to pivot to stage two. 
They do the actions and objectives and things they need in the environment to glean off knowledge of the industrial control system environments. And they say, hmm, engineering drawings, schematics, uh, PLC layouts, these are, these are all cool things. Um, now I know how this system operates. And the substation in New Orleans is way different than the substation in Biloxi. There's not a lot of commonality. So it really is a focused effort by the adversary. So then they'll have to develop something, either knowledge or a capability like malware. They have to test it out. Why do I assume they have to test it out? This is an axiom I have. It's an accepted assumption. The reason I say they're going to test it out is because no smart adversary, so you gotta, not all your adversaries are smart. I've met some of them. Eh, they're, you know, whatever. Anyways, any smart adversary running a multi-million dollar operation over months or years is not gonna develop a capability and launch it at you going, uh, I hope this works, click. You know, like you're actually gonna do some level of testing. Um, and then delivery, install, and execute of the actual attack. Interesting thing in ICS is it's actually likely not to be malware. It, it can, but more of the scenarios we're seeing is adversaries learning the ICS to use it against itself. If the system can take down power itself, why don't I just learn how to use the system and use it to take down power? So that's what happened in Ukraine. For those of you that are uninitiated into ICS and want to learn a lot about ICS, I wrote a paper. Um, I was, I was the, one of the lead investigators for the Ukraine uh, cyber attack in 2015. Um, an adversary, maybe Russia, maybe not. An adversary uh, broke into Obonergos and uh, energy companies in Ukraine and for the first time in history took down power as a result from cyber attack. And that's pretty cool. So we detailed the entire attack and all the things that happened and structured along those, that kill chain. The reason I highlighted ahead of the case studies is because if you want to generate hypotheses, and this is what I'm going to focus the last portion, the big portion of my talk on, if you want to focus on hypothesis generation, which is the core of hunting, coming up with a good hypothesis you're going to test, you must have expertise at some point in your career on the systems you're touching, period. Why do I not think the IT security folks coming into the ICS are gonna do a good job? Because they don't understand the systems and a well-intentioned IT security person is more harmful to an ICS than Russia, China, and Iran combined, okay? I need people to have expertise on sensitive systems, especially if they hope to hunt for adversaries. Why? Because the adversaries have spent the time learning those systems. And if you wanna have a playing field that's anywhere close to equal, you have to do the same. So understanding how those attacks work is useful. Let's get into hypothesis generation. David and I uh, wrote uh, a paper on this, and so Rob Lee and I and David uh, really wrote the first one. I forgot Rob was on there. He's gonna kill me later. Rob was on that first who, what, where, when, and how paper. David and I wrote this one, which says, if you're gonna do hunting, you're generating one of three types of hypotheses. Just if you're hunting, it's coming from one of three places. One is friendly or threat intelligence. So some form of intelligence, maybe your folks are doing something and you're aware of that, and maybe the adversary is gonna do something different, so you create a hypothesis on that. Or you read a report and understand that how an adversary is gonna work and you look for it. Situational awareness is larger, larger awareness around what's going on in that industry, the organization, um, technical as well as non-technical. And then domain expertise. When people say things like, it's an art, it's not a science, that's bullshit. They just don't know that it's a science and they haven't figured out a way to articulate it yet. So we have to understand it's actually a domain expertise aspect and we gotta figure out why it works. It frustrates me to no end walking into some senior shop and the senior hunter or whatever else, you're like, what do you do on a database? I don't know, man, figure it out. Like we just find stuff. Like you need to be fired. Like that is not an appropriate way. Like what are you actually doing that's repeatable and successful? I just get lucky. No, you don't. Figure out what it is if you ever hope to make that organization better. All right, so case study number one. Let's look at an intelligence-driven hypothesis-based case study in manufacturing. So we had a manufacturing client. Uh, when you think manufacturing, it runs everything from Campbell's soup to like weapons uh, uh, and missiles and, and all that kind of good stuff. Manufacturing is a large, large field. Anyways, a manufacturer customer, and they were concerned about their security. So one of the hypotheses we generated was uh, if uh, an adversary is gonna do anything destructive, they need to understand the environments, going back to that kill chain model. And it was an intelligence-driven hypothesis because we'd already knew that there were adversaries operating in the world that specifically wanted to go after these types of manufacturing lines. So we knew there was a threat out there, we were informed by that, 
and we knew the model for doing an attack. So we had an intelligence inject, if you will, from a mindset of there's badness, how do I find it now based off what I know the adversary is doing? So the thought process was if they're going to go after and do anything destructive, they've got to get the engineering documents and understand how the systems work. Okay, where is that located? And we found that all of these sensitive ICS-related files weren't held in that facility. The system integrator and deployer of the system is the folks that actually have all the schematics and engineering drawings. So we ended up working with them to see if they had been breached. It's always great when you find a hypothesis that's not successful, a lot of good learning there. Unfortunately, the, well, this one was successful. They had been breached and they were saying, oh yeah, some of these engineering documents were stolen, but it wasn't a big deal. It is a huge deal, not to them, but to their customer, right? To the folks that rely on them. So an intelligence-driven hypothesis helped us realize that there was nothing going back and making sure that the integrator was informing the people that they set up the networks for and set up the ICS for, that they had been breached and very sensitive documents were being stolen that was needed to target that customer's environment. So the fix for that was policy. Ugh, boring. Rob's talking about policy at a hunting conference. Yeah, yeah, it was a policy thing. They specifically went back and looked at the master services agreement and SLAs and said, you must inform us in the future when these types of things occur in general, and these are now a priority one event for us, and you have to tell us in the future, like within six hours. So good information being driven back to a future approach, even though it's not automation of the thing in the way we would think about it. One of my favorite case studies. So situational awareness can be difficult for folks because it requires you to look away from packets sometimes or away from memory forensics and things that excites us. In this case, uh, I had this hypothesis around uh, large construction projects in Africa. Specifically, there was a lot of announcements going out about new construction projects about new cool places that were ICS related, like hydroelectric facilities. And we usually give adversaries too much credit. We say, oh, they know how to target us, they know all these things. No, they don't, they're humans. Your adversary has management and PowerPoint too. They're just trying to get by, right? They're doing the thing. So I know that they've gotta have a way to figure out who to target in the world. They've gotta do target development. So a great way to do target development is to look for giant RFP announcements or construction project announcements and new things that are going on, get into the ground floor, and then if you ever need the access later on, you're part of the baseline and you can take advantage of it when you want. So we came up with the hypothesis based on the situational awareness around what was going on with these construction projects to say, hey, let's build out some infrastructure sites that are mimicking the ones that are getting built. Let's do some of the honeypot stuff. I didn't say anything about deception. Please don't go down that rabbit hole. But, uh, to, looked at like some honeypots and light well level stuff, and then also offered some free services to folks in the region to be able to find stuff. We ended up gaining access to some environments and finding some early adversary recon. An awesome opportunity to say, yep, it looks like adversaries are being interested in these environments. And of course, big announcements like, the most controversial dam in Ethiopia getting built is gonna draw some attention. So that's what you wanna focus on, good hypothesis. Last one I'll highlight, and one of my favorites as well, is a really basic one, and again, I love basic stuff, with domain expertise. So I know in most infrastructure sites, but especially in utilities like water and electric, that there's nothing that happens on that network in a, in a good way outside of maintenance periods. I just, I just know, having done it before, that if you're gonna do updates or patching or any sort of maintenance to, or updates to the system which classifies under maintenance, it's going to be a maintenance window. A specific time of year they actually do this. So I had the hypothesis, why don't we look for patching and updates to occur out of cycle? I don't know why, maybe an adversary is doing something, don't, I don't know, but let's, that's a good hypothesis. Let's come up with a way to look for adversaries doing stuff in environments outside of maintenance windows. So there were, at first, there was not a lot of data collection available, so it was a lot of manual checking of patches and, and the systems, but also doing some baselining of the network data, because you can usually get network data in ICS. Turns out, they were. They were infected, and there was an adversary who kept patching their systems for them, and that's what we found. We're like, why is this adversary patching these systems? And by all accounts, it looked like they were doing Bitcoin mining on the systems, and they kept patching them up so nobody else would infect them. This is great. Like, you outsource your IT support help, um, but preferably not to your adversary. So uh, future automations just around collection of that to be able to see and include the temporal aspect of when things should happen in a network with our collection to make sure that we're actually tying up our hunting efforts. But you'll notice a theme here as I sort of end this out. Nothing I've said is super sexy, crazy, amazing, oh my gosh, next level stuff. And nothing I've talked about is things that 
couldn't use automation after the fact. But the initial hypothesis generation is how we slowly move that automation umbrella forward, whether it's in an IDS, an SLA, or AI. Don't care what, you, what it is. Don't care the hype in the industry. All of it has its place. But we move that needle forward through the human v human aspect of it. That's what it's about. That's why we're here. And it is entirely accessible to all of you. All of you can do it. Your adversary may not care about you, but I do. You can do it, guys, all right? So recap, threat hunting is a human process. Anybody that tells you different is likely trying to sell you something. Automation is key to doing everything we do. But you can't solely rely on it, and you better understand what's being automated. Otherwise, you'll never know why the alert occurred and what to do about it. Number three, hunting for threats in places like ICS ends up being really awesome. I highly encourage anybody that's interested in the ICS community uh, to go check it out. I have a blog out there as well with a whole list of resources about how to get started in the ICS community. If, if whatever else, you can hit me up after the fact. I have like a fourth point that you can't see because it's invisible and it's a new product. Uh, number fourth point is Alex is doing some great stuff. So a lot of this started off with uh, Alex and I uh, debating each other. But the dude is freaking awesome, so I'll just give a hat tip to Alex up here while I'm on stage to note that he and his folks are doing some amazing things on the automation front, uh, and I'm really excited about the developments we're seeing in the community. So with that, I'll close it out. Thank you so much for your time and patience today. Enjoy the rest of your conference.